Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press and we're beginning with the daily independent newspaper. The headline reads, World Bank raises Nigeria's growth forecast to 1.8%. Why vehicle smugglers should change FG? That's according to the dealers. Ongoing bloodbath is like what obtains in war. Bajabi Amila. Lawmakers recall killings in their constituencies. Southwest Caucus demands actions from Buhari. Reps summoned Lai Mohammed over Twitter ban. House divided as PDP Caucus stages walk out. IPOB alleges plot to attack Igbo communities. Governor Uzodima says, I can't guarantee security in Imo alone. Cannabis cultivation is multi billion naira business, Akira Delu reiterates. Air Peace crew foils attempts to traffic two babies. Major media, government websites live again after outage in several countries. Serap, others drag federal government to echo as court over Twitter ban. Action sends wrong signals to investors, NESG warns. We're meeting our loan obligation with Afrexim Bank. That's according to Dangote Group. And UBA, DEG, signed $50 million facility to support small businesses. All right, now on the Punch newspapers, Can warns as AGF vows to try Adiboye VIP offenders. We are, we are definitely on it to ensure the prosecution of all violators, declares Malami's office. Adiboye, others, uh, and other clerics, VIP's prosecution will compound Nigeria's problems, can tell the federal government. House of Representatives split, tempers rise over federal government's ban. PDP lawmakers stage walkout. Also, UNFPA sets Nigeria's population at 211 million, life expectancy at 54. NL NLNG signs gas delivery agreements with power plants. Still on the punch this morning, immigration warns racketeers as passport portal reopens. Lagos mechanics and technicians protest against takeover of workshops. And Amotekun will carry AK-47s if federal government approves license. That's from Governor Shea Makindi. Uh, also this morning, federal government shortlist 550,000 for NPAR final selection. And uh, SIM and NIN linkage, telcos lose 19.20 million subscribers in five months. A few others this morning, Buhari, service chiefs and others meet. Uzodima blames opposition again. World Bank raises Nigeria's 2021 growth forecast to 1.8%. And 200 fresh Nigerian doctors in the UK swell list to 8,384. These are the stories we can share on the pond this morning. On the Nation newspaper, MAN, LCCI laments slide in power supply to firms and homes. World Bank worries about energy deficit. Businesses, households grown. CBN raises customs exchange rates to 404.97 naira to a dollar. Igbo leaders, sans, it's time to end killings. Waboeze Kalu Koshun. Senate honors TB Joshua. World Bank, Nigeria's 1.8% growth tied to stable rates. NLNG revenue hits $110 billion. Also in the Nation newspaper, Twitter suspension throws reps into rowdy session. PDP lawmakers says we will continue to tweet CSOs at ECOWAS court. Government asks judicial workers to reopen courts. Reps caucus find Igongo assailants. Also on the Nation newspaper this morning, EFCC apprehends 50 internet fraud suspects. And lastly, North, North Central leaders reject secession. All right. Um, now on the Guardian newspapers. Federal government talks tough, insists Twitter ban is indefinite. Malami logs into suspended sites to deactivate account. But Jabir Mila orders probe into property of, of uh, sorry, priority of, uh, propriety, I beg your pardon, of ban. Senate silent as PDP reps stage walkout insist on reversal. And also Serap takes Buhari to echo as court over suspension. Uh, we can also see in The Guardian, save nation from total collapse. NC front begs Gowan and others. 
Africa's COVID-19 vaccination drive suffers setbacks as Nigeria gets $900 million health grant. North Central leaders oppose secession. And also, I can't guarantee security in Imo, says Uzodimma. We can also see here on the Guardian newspapers this morning, Biosa government impounds 34 cows for violating anti-open grazing law. And the apathy and distrust hamper anchor borrowers program, say North Central Farmers. Um, I think that's all that we can share this morning on The Guardian. Good morning to Kayode Ladengde, Senior News Editor. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, good morning, Nasaoge. Good morning. Morning. Um, of good morning, Aneta. Big conversation is still on the Twitter ban. Uh, but, of course, uh, the events from yesterday, PDP law some PDP lawmakers staging a walkout and, of course, saying that they will continue um, uh, tweeting. The uh, speaker, Femi Bajabi Amila, has also uh, stated that the uh, Minister of Information and Culture will be invited to the House uh, on this issue. Quickly, what are your thoughts? Yes, that's one of the things of um, what we call democracy across the whole uh, you would expect a whole lot of hypocrisy where the party in power will want to stay on one position even when some of them don't agree. So you wouldn't expect the likes of the Speaker of the House of Representatives to go against the President or the federal government decision. And like I was also making an allusion about the Governor of uh, Lagos State when he was also asked. They tried to deflect the question. These are all people who were also affected by this uh, not well thought out decision by the presidency. So I wasn't surprised, and I wasn't also surprised with the way the PDP reps also took up the matter. This is just to underscore the fact that um, federal government needs to revisit the issue. They need to rethink about their decision if the president's ego was hurt by Twitter, it shouldn't affect the 200 million, or maybe not 200 million Twitter users now, but at least 50 million. And this is a pointer that there is nothing to lose if you follow the path of humility. Your point has been made. You've been able to tell uh, Twitter that they were a bit one-sided by just uh, 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 turning, a, turning their eyes away from uh, uh, IPOB suites and uh, taking the government, you know, head on. So if that point has been made, I think it's time to revisit that thing and let us come back. You can see what is happening to notable clergymen making statements, even though a lot of people have also kind of lampooned the decision, I mean, the statement by this revered man of God that Twitter is not definitely for Nigerian audience. When anybody is using the platform, if Osauge is using the platform, it's not just for Nigerian audience. So their excuse, it shouldn't just be for their church. They should stand up for Nigerians, so to say. So it's not just about their ministry. And there is absolutely nothing wrong if clergymen also speak the mind of a lot of people. Uh, I understand that theocracy may be different from democracy, but in this case, both theocracy and democracy seem to agree. So I totally believe that the decision of the government was unpopular. So um, we know that um, Sarap and others have dragged the federal government to ECOWAS court over the Twitter ban. What do you think might happen? You know, what do you think would, would be the outcome of this of this <laughs> situation? And also the invitation of and also the invitation of the um, Minister of Information. Yes, um, the Minister of Information uh, comment is also quite sensitive. But let me quickly look at what Aneta said. In the real sense of the word, um, ECOWAS technically is being controlled by Nigeria, but we've also seen judgment from ECOWAS. For example, remember the former National Security Advisor when ECOWAS court ruled that it should be released. Nigerian government disobeyed. They ignored it until much pressure, and they now did it with Teshuare then. So what I'm saying is, Falano is just on the part of history that let it not be said that they were not challenged. So even ECOWAS court, if they decide, government is not likely to obey. But it is on record 
another record of disobedience to the rule of law because Nigeria is a member state of ECOWAS. They should respect whatever ECOWAS court says. However, based on what the Minister of Information said, if I get you correctly, he was also talking about Malami will decide what will happen to this clergyman. That is also a very, very sensitive thing he has said. You have to consider the, 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 the followers, you have to consider, this is not just about your law, which, which is still debatable, you have to also consider the social implications of how many people are following this clergyman. So the AGN, sh I mean the AGF should be, uh, uh, should exercise this power with caution, otherwise we might be running into a more chaotic situation. All right, now let's move uh, and talk a little bit about security. Uh, the Oyo State Governor, Shea Makinde, is asking uh, for licensing so that uh, Amotekun can carry AK-47s. Uh, how much help do you think this would um, offer? <laughs> this is also a wake-up call to fast-track the Constitution review, to fast-track the issue of devolution of power. As we speak... It may, not, it may be counterproductive if you are reacting to some isolated situations. However, it is time that those people who are given the responsibility of protecting the people should not be uh, lethargic. People are being killed, people are being slaughtered in their home country, and you are telling them not to carry weapons. The Benue state governor is even taking the hard way by saying, I want my people to retaliate. This is getting to a terrible situation. And governors are likely to now come out, especially from the south, to say that enough is enough. So before we get into this chaotic situation, the police, the army need to protect the people. I'm not talking about going to those sites when 20 people have been slaughtered or 11 people have been killed, you need to protect the people. So the law does not permit them to be carrying weapons now because we are not yet practicing the federalism that you and I are, are aware of. But let there be a constitutional review on that. Let there be state policing that these people can be integrated into the security paraphernalia and they will be given weapons. But for now, let's not be lawless. And in um, Imo says Uzalima has said he can't uh, secure the state alone. And this hmm. is after, you know, the PDP, APC um, squabble over security in Imo state. You know, they praised Uzalima, saying he's doing well, but now he's saying he, he can't do this alone. Uh, which other, you know, agencies should we be looking at? Should we be looking at the Southeast, you know, security network? Should we be looking at the new Ibubayagu state policing? What other options should we be looking towards now for security in the Southeast? It's quite sad. I, I listened to the governor and also saw some bit of helplessness, but at the same time, I also blame him for tagging the whole thing to a political issue. He may have superior intelligence, he may have superior information about it, but I think if you believe it's political, then name the people. Let them be arrested, let them be prosecuted. If they are your opponents and they perpetuate in crimes and you have facts and information before you, let them be dealt with. Posterity will be on your side that you are not victimizing the opponent. Let there be outcry rather than the people being killed all in the name of political uh, assassination. However, I just felt that um, when the governor said the security is not for him, some people say alone is a normal rhetoric so that to say that security is a business of all. It's not just the people in power. He was almost a victim too. So and that's to let us know that wherever you know, if you have any information on who is carrying out this dastardly act across the state, report them to the authority and let them be dealt with. So I sincerely believe that it's also a wake up call to state policing. I we should also not forget that the, the, the governors in different states may also want to use this to victimize their opponent. But I think the advantages for having state policing are more.
All then right. not doing it. Um, moving on to health now. On the punch this morning, it says uh, 200 fresh Nigerian doctors swell uh, the numbers in the UK to 8,384. And that's just in the UK. Um, in Saudi Arabia and the US, as you know, other countries that have thousands and thousands of Nigerian doctors uh, leaving to find um, greener pastures over there. I don't know why I'm taking deep breaths in most of these headlines. <laughs> they are actually very disheartening. But it's not, it's not news. In case some people don't know, um, 70%, either 70 or 75% of black doctors in America are Nigerians. And I can tell you for sure, I've been to one or two hospitals in the U.S. where I heard people speaking our native dialect. And I was wondering, am I back in Nigeria? So this is something that is real. This is something that we don't appear that we are ready to stem the tide. We don't appear that we are ready to help the situation. And you know, the sad part of the whole commentary is that the people in government, some of their children also read medicine, some of them are not practicing here. So what conscience, what morality will they preach to say that doctors should stay back. So we'll continue to have flights, we'll continue to have, um, call it brain drain, whatever English you want to use. If we don't do the needful, if we don't pay our doctors well, if we don't up the game, if we don't provide the facilities, if we don't prioritize education and health, we are still an underdeveloped country, not even developing country. Because we keep deceiving as though we are developing, we are developing, and we are one of the three countries in the world with electricity deficit. So the issue of darkness is already becoming moribund in different parts of the world. So there is more we need to do than just, you know, casting the headlines and say that will change the tide. Hmm. It's not going to do it. Okay, it seems this is a bit of a positive news um, with held headlines today. Um, on the Daily Independence and the Punch, it says that the World Bank raises Nigeria's growth forecast to 1.8%. And they're saying this is based on projections that the oil price will increase. You know, there'll be structural reforms in the oil sector. Uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdowns uh, would be eased off. Economic activities would pick up. So <clears throat> I don't know what you think about this, but nonetheless, yeah. the, the World Bank report also said that output in Nigeria is not expected to return to its 2019 levels until the end of 2022. And while we should be celebrating with this report and this forecast, we are not supposed to rejoice because this is dependent on the fact that the price of oil is coming up again. I think the last time I checked, it was about $70 to a barrel. And that is something that tells us that everything we call growth is always dependent on oil. So when the oil fluctuates again, we go back. So why rejoice over this mono-dependent uh, economy? And so it's not something to rejoice over. We should be looking at growth in our telecoms. You know, the new gold is, is data. And you can see a whole lot of Nigerians consuming data. What is stopping us from creating more local uh, telecoms companies? You know, where is this money going to? Are they being deployed into our economy? That should be our worry. So my worry is, it's not the prediction, it's not the forecast to let us feel that, uh, oh, there's going to be growth soon. No, no, no. If the price of oil falls again, we are back to square one. All right. So also, I'm more interested in things that are sustainable. That is other sectors rather than oil. Okay. So we know that um, Akir Delu has been pushing for the legalization of cannabis. He says it's a multi-billion naira uh, business and that in other countries is visited at, like Thailand. They cash in with this um, medicinal herb and you know that it's great for pharmaceutical uses and all of that. Um, where do you, do you see this heading in a country <laughs> like ours where, you know, uh, uh, NDLE is I'm doing drug bust every day, you know? I, I'm laughing out loud because I know that uh, we've been told over time that cannabis should be discouraged. People engage in cannabis to hurt themselves. 
and it's sad that that's our reality. So if we must embrace this, and I totally agree with Akure Dolu, that most of the things we call evil, most of the things that are destroying us, a lot of nations are using it for their benefit. So it's for us to have an, a serious introspect. If we put the right regulatory thing in place, rather than burning all this cannabis and destroying it, let's deploy it for something useful, something that will bring revenue to the nation. So it's, it, it's just the general principle that most people in this part of the world, what we call problem, what we call challenges, is what other people use to their own advantage. So there is practically nothing that is harmful if you are creative and innovative. You All can right. turn it for your good. Kairi Ladendi, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank uh, you. Interesting views on uh, every one of these issues. Good morning. All right, stay with us. Uh, what happened on this day in history? That's what we're coming back uh, with next on the 9th of June. I'm going back to the year, actually just a couple of years ago, 2015, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, our National Assembly. And I'm going uh, to the UK to tell you about a nationwide celebration for the Queen.